went to Ecuador with Scott Stribble's Rainforest class in March of 2008. I was a member of the first orn academic ornithological expedition uh, ever it, that Yale's ever done, uh, and we went to Ecuador with Rick Crum. I went to Calle Santiago, which is an island off the coast of Puerto Rico, to do research with rhesus macaques. I got to go to Sicily as a part of uh, the class Global Tectonics. It was over spring break. Uh, we were actually working geologists for uh, two weeks. Hey, you guys might not believe this, but this is what we are doing on our vacation. The, the courses uh, that we have is, is centered on the idea that the students are going to collect uh, plant samples that they're going to then study for the summer. And they bring them back uh, to Yale and from there they isolate microbes and we end up with uh, a case that students have anywhere from 50 to 100 microbes each, many of which are novel. In fact, it's quite routine for these students to identify uh, microbes that are novel at the level of genus. I found a new genus as well. so. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you can buy these. Well, taking away from it was really just kind of the adventure of going out and experiencing science in the field. A lot of time we get stuck in lab, and I know since then I've been in lab 10 to 20, maybe even 30 hours a week. But going there in the initial part, you kind of got a sense of how much fun it can be to just kind of go out and see what you find. It sort of made science a very creative, uh, interacting experience rather than just your typical um, reading textbooks. Um, instead, we were actually practicing and doing science rather than learning what others have done. So we're isolating microbes that could have utility and use and become model systems for various types of investigation, including things related to biofuels and natural product production. It gives you a sense of how huge the scope of science can be if you let it be, and instead of just focusing in on like the test tube you're looking at. The idea was to take them to a place where there are lots of diverse geologic phenomena, things that are going on right now, volcanoes, or uh, earthquakes, uh, other kinds of events, and to directly expose them to Earth history. <laughs> I think it's most important just to get out of the textbook. Like you'll read about something and you'll say, okay, and you'll memorize it, you'll take a test about it. But once you actually see it in the field or see two concepts that you learned, maybe three chapters apart, like right next to each other, everything sort of clicks. The actual collision zone is down in southern Sicily here. The leading edge, the active, active fault between Africa and Europe is is you can actually put your hand on this region. We took a ferry out to the Oilan Islands and climbed Mount Stromboli in a day, and that was something that was just incredible because I never done anything like that. I'm not a hiker, a nature girl. Okay, Arjun and other people who are out there, if you can hear the sound, no, it's died down a little bit. Before, there was a tremendous sort of almost deafening avalanche sound. It's not a very high volcano, but it's actively erupting all the time. You hear this boom and suddenly you see globs of lava going up in the air. And uh, it's really quite stunning, um, and in fact, a little bit impressive that they actually let you to go up there. We had to wear helmets, and we stopped halfway up, and I didn't really get why we were wearing helmets. I thought it was just a, a liability thing. Um, we heard this huge explosion, uh, and our, our guy stopped and said, well, uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, there's, there's explosive rock flying off the mountain. But once we got to the top, we could actually see magma exploding. I mean, this isn't like the kind of lava that you see in Hawaii where it kind of nicely oozes out and you can walk up to it. I mean, this is explosive lava that we were looking at. When um, climbing down, it was uh, volcanic ash, so it was like running down a sand hill. This is so amazing. This is really cool. We're like kind of snowshoeing down some dirt. It took us a few hours to get up and probably 45 minutes to get down just because we got to run down the hill as fast as we could. So it was really cool. The reason we study monkeys is we're actually interested in how humans make sense of the world. And what we want to do is take an evolutionary approach. So we actually study how monkeys make sense of their world to try to figure out how humans do and what aspects of how we think might actually be unique to humans. And what are the kinds of things that might be shared with monkeys. There are just monkeys everywhere you look. It's not a zoo. They don't live in cages. They're completely free-ranging. This is Tolerance, session two. We're with 31J and 61R. It just made it that much more interesting and that much more practical to learn more about primary social behavior in the field and in a natural setting as opposed to in a lab where a lot of the social behavior is governed by the fact that they are in a lab.
So I conducted the study looking at in-group, out-group biases, um, monkey racism. We wanted to see if rhesus macaques also display the same biases that humans do. My specific question had to do with mating behavior in the rhesus macaque monkeys. 25N and 51A. The cues that male rhesus macaques pick up on when uh, female rhesus macaques are sort of fertile or ready for mating and if they incorporate that into attraction. In the time I've been at Yale, I've been able to go down there with about 50 different undergraduate students who've gone down there and helped me with research. And since then, we've had about 20 publications with undergraduate students. Ended up presenting my results at a conference last April at the Society for Research and Child Development in Denver. We're getting published. Our study is getting published in a scientific journal. We'll see. I'll see in this, eh? But that's interesting. You know, it really just gives undergraduates the opportunity to be real collaborators by being able to go down to this field site and study these questions. It made me feel for the first time like an actual scientist. The experience of going outside and actually using your senses to engage with biodiversity itself is something that you can't learn in the classroom. Yale students have a great education in testing hypotheses in analyzing data and discussing ideas and figuring out ways to test them. But their classroom education cannot give them another essential element, which is going outside and using your senses, using your wits to observe biodiversity, to record it, and to understand uh, how it lives. Daniel, are you excited? Uh, I'm not awake yet. <laughs> yes. So we'd wake up very early in the morning, um, normally 4 to 5, 6 when we were lucky, a.m. Generally closer to 4. And then for the next 18 to 20 hours, you're pretty much outside bird watching. Where's the green dot? Just to the right of the green dot. This is a really rare bird, guys. Right above that. There it is. It's on the trunk of the tree now. It's so intense. And there's so many things that you have to take in at once that it's almost overwhelming, but it's because you have people there that really know what they're talking about they, and, and are great teachers. It was really uh, a really incredible experience. In the Amazon, we climb this huge, huge rickety wooden tower, and we're able to stand out over all the trees and just see bird after bird after bird. Um, they just kept coming, and we saw toucans, and parrots would fly over squawking. And I. I I really don't like heights that much, and I was completely afraid we went up there. It was just so cool. That's him. Sam. <laughs> Here we are, 37 meters above the rainforest fall in the canopy in Ecuador, <laughs> and we've seen lemon throated bobbins and three plum throated katingas in the same tree. It was exquisite. We can't wait to find out what we're going to see next. <laughs> I think it's very important to see things um, in their natural habitat the way they really are. And calling, flying around, building nests. I mean, it's totally, it's a totally different, uh, totally different experience. And getting the context is very important. The most memorable part of the trip was probably the oil bird cave. Seeing an oil bird cave is one of the most bizarre ornithological experiences you could have. All of a sudden, we heard this screaming noise, and there were these largish birds flying overhead and making both screaming noises and these weird clicking. They were echolocating. And then we turned on the flashlights, and, and on every little ledge, there, was, there were one or two of the chicks, and the chicks were actually bigger than the adults. It was terrifying at one, you know, on one hand, but it was also really cool. It's really fantastic to show. It took them to the very edges of uh, ornithological experience. When my friends ask me um, about my experience in Puerto Rico, I always say that it was the most rewarding experience I've ever had in Yale. It was an opportunity that I don't think I could get anywhere else. Hey, Chelsea, your smile for the camera. I was a perspective major, and then this kind of pushed me over the edge into geology. Coming in, I always said I wanted to go to law school, <laughs> and now I'm definitely thinking about master's and PhD programs. I'm taking a lot of science classes this year. I'm a biophysics major. Um, but yeah, the class has definitely spurred uh, 
uh, an interest in science me for the rest of my life. For me, at least, now I'm so excited about going to new places and finding new things that I think no matter what I do, I want to incorporate that. It really got me engaged in outreach and looking at international collaboration. And now whenever I think about science research, I think about going abroad and looking at resources that no one's looked at. It definitely has shaped how I think I'll be interacting with the science community in the future. When I heard that Rick was doing this trip, um, I was actually pre-med. And, uh, and so I really kind of rethought my priorities and uh, decided that that's what I wanted to do. Whoa. As someone who was, wasn't sure about studying biology in general, it totally changed my perspective and really made me switch over to evolutionary biology. Go. <laughs> you guys having fun? Swimming in the Amazon. Yeah, man. Great. <laughs> Woo. Great.